like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine's Healthy Longevity Webinar. This is the first one of 2023, so we hope we'll bring you a series of uh, informative shows on aging uh, this year. I have to say that it's uh, I'm in the middle of the U.S. in the middle of the night, <laughs> and it's cold out there, girls and boys, so uh, it's uh, don't go outside if you're where I am. Uh, the weather keeps getting crazier and crazier in the U.S. during the winter. We're having all kinds of new terms like bomb cyclones, which means a whole lot of rain. <laughs> and um, But I'm not worried about it because the half of the U.S. government is still telling me that there's no such thing as climate change. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we can move on to science of aging. And we have an exciting night tonight because we have Vincenzo Sorrentino on, who's a new professor at National University of Singapore, and I'll get to him in a second. Uh, before I do that, I wanna remind you to use the Q&A function. I'm always impressed by the quality of the questions from the audience, and I'm sure tonight will be no different. Uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, Lim Kai Shuang, who's a research assistant at National University Health Center, and she'll be talking about, or be talking about psychosocial factors influencing eating behaviors in older adults. Thank you for the kind introduction. As mentioned, my name is Lim Kai Shen, and today I'm going to introduce a paper, Psychosocial Factors Influencing the Eating Behaviors of Older Adults, a systematic review published in May this year in Aging Research Reviews. Existing research into older adults' eating behavior has less consideration on psychosocial factors. What are psychosocial factors? There are the social interaction people have in life that may impact individuals' mental well-being. According to previous research, psychological and social factors were highly associated with developing malnutrition. Therefore, the key concern of the review paper is to focus on how these factors facilitate or impede food intake. The authors assess a full range of psychosocial determinants that influence eating behaviors and aim to identify and evaluate the evidence for specific psychological and social factors that result in positive and negative eating behavior outcomes. A brief introduction to systematic reviews, unlike basic research where scientists test on cells and look at proteins, systematic reviews come through all published results on the relevant topic and analyze them. Because some studies are done in a small population, some with thousands of people, some only looking at younger population, the result may be different. So doing a systematic review, looks through all these details and try to come up with a summary for the question. For this systematic review, the authors combed through over 4,000 papers and through screening and exclusion. A total of 53 studies were included in the paper. 31 of them were quantitative and 22 were qualitative. The exclusion criteria included duplicated studies, participants below 60 years old, focused on other factors and non-eating outcome measurements. The authors concluded that food-related influences and age-related challenges 
would affect eating attitudes and connection and result in eating outcomes. They have found many interesting results, but today I would like to highlight one of the key findings, which is the eating arrangement. Eating arrangements are found to have consistent and significant influences on older adults' eating behaviors. The, next, the authors concluded that eating alone would bring a lot of negative effects, such as insufficient food intake, unhealthy BMI, lower food diversity, decreased consumption of fruit and vegetable, and a higher likelihood of skipping meals. In contrast, Commensal eating behavior, which is eating with others, would positively influence dietary habits, such as increased dietary diversity, mealtime regularity, and food satisfaction. This is because commensal eating behavior could provide or increase the opportunity for older adults to social modeling at mealtimes. It could further increase their food intake and diversity, and lead to healthier dietary habits. However, these positive influences occur depending on the relationship between older adults and the commercial person, which means sharing meals with your closest will benefit more on your dietary habits as compared to sharing meals with someone not so close. Besides this, eating arrangement is also related to living arrangement. The authors found that living with a spouse or partner would have a healthier diet than living alone or living with others. This suggests that eating habits developed within long-term relationships differ from those developed with other family members. The most important information to notice is that for older adults to maintain their dietary health and food enjoyment, is to ensure their sense of control over the food intake. There is a knowledge behavior gap in terms of what a healthy diet looks like for older adults. Due to this gap, simply providing nutritional information to older adults is not enough. More guidance is needed for better risk perception and preventative nutritional support. The final take-home message is that Please spend more meal time with parents or elderly and try to model good dietary habits for them. Here is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting. I think that um, we don't look enough into like not only what people eat, but how they eat and when they eat and how that influences aging. So studies like that are very important. Um, let me get to Vincenzo. He just joined our Healthy Longevity Translational Research Program. In fact, he's so new, he doesn't even have an office yet. He's using mine. So I can see my, my blinds have been fixed finally. So that's good. <laughs> um, and uh, he's an assistant professor here after being in, uh, a group leader in the Nestle Institute of Health Sciences in Switzerland for four years. And before that, he was a postdoc at the EPFL uh, as a translational scientist in the biology of aging and associated diseases. He'll be tar talking about targeting the mitochondrial proteostasis connection in aging and disease. Uh, welcome, Vincenzo, in more ways than one. Hi, Brian. Nice. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, very happy to be here today. And finally, officially as part of the LT Longevity program, you know, and uh, happy uh, to talk today about my talk. I will share my slides. Let me know if you see it. Yeah, good. Yeah, so thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm uh, very happy to, to join the LT Longevity webinars, hoping that a lot of people will be interested in the topics and uh, in my research interests that I've been cultivating for a while and that I intend to develop further here at NUS. And so, yeah, today I will be talking about targeting the mitochondria proteostasis connection in aging and disease. So, um, as we, as we all know, I mean, aging is becoming a global health concern. And I will give you also a couple of examples why it's becoming an health concern also in the Singaporean population. As you can see here on this uh, cartoon on the left, 
um, the uh, global population is uh, aging as we go. And by 2050, it is estimated that over 2 billion uh, uh, people in 2050 would be over uh, 60, 65 years old. And what this is on one end, good news, because as you can see here on this right plot here on these purple bars, the life expectancy for both men and women is increasing over the years. Actually, if you look down here in the light uh, blue color here, the years lived in good health are stagnant despite this increased lifespan. And this means that there's going to be an increased need to find solutions in order to reduce age-related diseases and complications that are preventing essentially this increase in healthy years in our lives. And if we look at the Singaporean situation, it's actually not going much better. For instance, here I'm giving you two examples of uh, some uh, highly prevalent conditions in the Singaporean population. Here on top, you can see a plot showing the incidence of sarcopenia in the population. Uh, this is from 2021, this paper showing that uh, by age groups, you can see that in the elderly groups of the Singaporean population, the incidence of sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle function and muscle mass, is actually increasing. And if you adjust for more updated guidelines from 2019, looking at this uh, dotted line here, the uh, incidence is even higher, indicating that probably there was an underestimation before. If we look at the dementia, which is the most common form of neurodegeneration worldwide and is also highly prevalent in Singapore, uh, this cartoon from the Dementia Singapore Foundation uh, um, uh, gives uh, some uh, idea of how this is going. For instance, they mentioned that in Singapore, one in 10 uh, people over 60 years and above may have a form of dementia. And in 2018, already more than 100,000 people in Singapore were diagnosed with a form of dementia. And these numbers are constantly on the rise. So while uh, aging is a very uh, complex um, and uh, important things to tackle, uh, what would we need to understand from a biological perspective as scientists, how, to, um, how the biology process occurs, why it happens, and if we can modulate it. And in this cartoon here from this updated, uh, now uh, just from a couple of days ago, um, a review on the all marks of aging from Lopez Sotin and others, um, what has been um, sort of, uh, upcoming the last years and clarified is that aging is characterized by several hallmarks, um, uh, biological hallmarks that become dysfunctional um, during the aging process. And these include things such as, for instance, mitochondrial dysfunction, loss of proteostasis, also decreased uh, macroautophagy, uh, cellular senescence, and so forth. However, one thing we need to keep in mind is that all the most of the chronic uh, conditions uh, associated with aging, such as neurodegeneration, for instance, Alzheimer's disease and sarcopenia that I mentioned before, but also cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease or immunosenescence, share some of these uh, um, biological hallmarks of aging um, with the aging process itself. Therefore, understanding how we can tackle these hallmarks and how they are integrated actually could provide us new opportunities for delaying these conditions and also promote healthy longevity. And related to this, I would say, especially in my experience so far, coming from academia and then going to a company and now back to academia, I would say that the key principles of uh, longevity research that to me, but I think all scientists in this field we should um, um, pursue is really these two concepts. On one end, we really need to understand the connections between the hallmarks of aging. So this is a cartoon actually from uh, Brian's review from a few years ago, really showing nicely that uh, it's important to tackle the interconnections rather than looking at the individual hallmarks of aging. And on the other end, uh, what I learned, especially in my uh, experience with Nestle Institute of Health Sciences, and I'm very grateful for this coming as a preclinical scientist, is that it's really key to bridge, uh, what's going to be important is to bridge the gap between preclinical and clinical science in order to really bring to uh, translation and to, uh, to, to the public some of our understanding. And for instance, uh, this is the, the pipeline that I implemented when I joined a slide research coming from a preclinical space was already making use of a cross-species approach ranging from human samples to uh, mouse samples to cell lines and even the nematode model C. elegans for the biology of aging in order to understand how processes such as mitochondrial pro, um, homeostasis, muscle, brain and kidney health would decline in aging. And uh, while our discoveries are important for this, what was key in my uh, experience in the company was really the integration with the clinical scientists. So all our decisions and results were discussed with the clinical scientists daily, uh, weekly, in order to really 
bridges knowledge and reach uh, the first uh, proof of concept clinical studies for human and uh, veterinary applications. And in this effort to try to bridge this knowledge gap, um, uh, we have also written a few reviews from my time there that are listed here for your interest, uh, bridging uh, where they, we are basically compiling preclinical and clinical understanding for some of these fields. So I invite you to read them if you are interested. Now, uh, talking about the interconnection between the hallmarks of aging today, I want to give you examples from my uh, recent and uh, previous research on, inter uh, on the interconnection between mitochondrial dysfunction and proteostasis, first in the context of um, Alzheimer's disease and then moving to muscle aging. So regarding the interconnection between mitochondria and Alzheimer's disease, first of all, for people that may not be still familiar with what mitochondria are, essentially these are not only the organelles important for energy production, so uh, through oxidative phosphorylation of fatty acid oxidation to generate energy in our cells, in our body, but they also have a, a very complex array of functions. For instance, they are involved in apoptosis, they control calcium metabolism, and they are themselves very dynamic organelles that can assume different shapes and readapt based on the needs of the cell, the metabolic needs of the cells, and communicate with the nucleus and other organelles in order to adapt uh, to these metabolic needs. And very importantly, uh, the mitochondria are equipped with stress response mechanisms in order to cope with the cellular changes and with the cellular insults that may occur. And in terms of stress response mechanisms, I'm showing you a very simplified cartoon of the two main uh, pathways involved in uh, mitochondrial stress response adapted from this review from 2015. One pathway you may be uh, familiar with is called mitophagy, which, which allows the cells essentially to uh, get rid by the um, through degradation of highly damaged mitochondria shown here in red, while preserving essentially the healthy mitochondrial pool. And then you have UPRMT, which is the unfolded protein response of the mitochondria, which is a sort of more uh, uh, sort of broader uh, stress sensing program of the cells, where essentially stressed mitochondria can signal back to the nucleus in order for the nucleus to uh, produce the, uh, uh, the, uh, the transcripts uh, to activate the transcription program that will lead to the production of enzymes, proteins that are all important for the mitochondria to be equipped and resist to the stress. And therefore, the whole mitochondria pool will become, in this sense, more stressed, but more uh, tolerant also to, uh, to resist to damage. And so in the context of Alzheimer's uh, disease and mitochondria, what was already established already from the late 80s all the, uh, all the way up to now is that Alzheimer's disease is known to be characterized by a proteostasis dysfunction because uh, basically uh, some of the hallmarks of the disease include the presence of the uh, protein aggregates from amyloid beta, aggregates and plaques, or for instance, tau filaments uh, and entangles. Uh, and while these were shown and uh, are known to be linked to the presence of uh, or the um, uh, occurrence of mitochondrial dysfunction with mitochondria be, uh, being able to respire less, producing less CTP, and therefore leading to metabolic dysfunction. The opposite, whether we could intervene on mitochondria to improve Alzheimer's disease and reduce protein aggregation was actually not uh, established yet. And in this uh, last few years, work uh, that I uh, conducted at EPFL and also work from Fanfei uh, with Willem Bohr and now uh, in Norway, have actually worked in this direction to show that you can actually target mitochondria in order to improve proteostasis and reduce Alzheimer's disease. And I'll give you here a few examples. Uh, before I go into the results, I want to also show you the type of pipeline that I'm using for my experiments. So what we do, we make use in order to accelerate discoveries and then validate them back into uh, mammalian systems. We make use of bioinformatics and molecular approaches, for instance, using um, samples from patients, from Alzheimer's disease mice, and then trying to validate them in, with a cross-species approach in cells and nematodes in order to identify conserved targetable pathways or genes. We use the C. elegans actually because it's a very um, uh, nice model for performing in vivo experiments in a relatively short time. It has a conserved homology to most of the uh, disease relevant genes for humans. It has a short lifespan and it allows genetic and compound interventions. And there is a lot of phenotyping that you can do on the worms. And very importantly, there are uh, several transgenic lines uh, that have been generated in order to mimic some of the aspects of human disease. For instance, you can use a worm for a bit accumulation to mimic uh, the, um, the damage observed in Alzheimer's disease. And once we have identified the best therapeutic approaches in the nematode, we can go back and validate them in cells or in Alzheimer's disease mice. Now, to get to some of the results, to give you a flavor of this, 
when we looked at Alzheimer's disease uh, brain samples from a mild cognitive um, impairment patients or Alzheimer's disease patients in red here versus uh, healthy individuals, and we looked at genes involved in the UPRMT or mitophagy mitochondrial stress response pathways, we interestingly saw that both pathways were actually induced in the context of the disease. And when we go now to mice, importantly to a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease here in red versus healthy mice, again, we saw that the same pathways and the same genes are again induced. And to give you a very simple summary uh, in a visual manner of all this work, it turns out that essentially during my, um, Alzheimer's disease, there is mitochondrial stress um, occurring and therefore the mitochondria uh, induce UPRMT and mitophagy in order to lead back to mitochondrial homeostasis. Now, we wanted to try to model this, as I mentioned, also in a simple model, and we used an A-bit accumulation uh, model for C. elegans, which basically, when you uh, look at this, uh, the uh, formation of A-bit uh, uh, aggregates in these worms, you can see them here through Western blotting very clearly that the Alzheimer's disease worms, let's call them this way, they show the accumulation of A-beta compared to healthy worms. And uh, when you now look at the genes again for UPRMT and mitophagy, which are conserved in the worms similar to humans and mouse, we see that the same signature is once more up. Therefore, this prompted us to use this model uh, for uh, genetic and compound interventions that we will then uh, validate later in uh, mammalian systems. And looking again at the cartoon of the, of the UPRMT and mitophagy, and in this case in the worms, What's known from literature is that you can induce UPRMT and mitophagy through several genetic and compound interventions. Some of the uh, most, uh, I would say, established or um, um, known and also easy to apply uh, compound interventions so far is the use of NAD boosters, such as nicotinamide riboside. What this uh, nicotinamide riboside does or NAD boosters do in general is they increase NAD levels and through that they activate C twin genes, which in turn will boost mitochondrial homeostasis. And on top of that, work from my ex lab and also from again from Feng, uh, Feng Fei and Willem Bohr's lab have shown that actually NAD boosters also lead to induction for instance of UPRMT and mitophagy. Therefore we resorted to use NAD precursors in order to boost these pathways and now look at amyloid aggregation in the worms. Now when we treat uh, the amyloid beta or Alzheimer's disease worms with nicotinamide riboside and we look again at the accumulation of amyloid beta aggregates we can see that uh, nicely nicotinamide riboside treatment reduces the amyloid beta aggregation. And when we now move back to a mammalian system, in this case, neuronal, human neuronal cell line, which expresses a mutated form of APP, leading to the presence of amyloid beta aggregates within the cells, similar to what observed on the worms, as shown here in green, you can see that with an R, we have actually again a reduction of this intracellular uh, amyloid beta aggregates in cells. So, with this in mind, uh, knowing that the NR treatment uh, reduces A-beta aggregation in worms and even increases L-span, which I'm not showing here for simplicity, but we have data showing that the worms are actually doing better. We were wondering, what about uh, amyloid plaques in a, in a brain, for instance, in the brain of an Alzheimer's disease mouse? And what about memory performance, which is actually the ultimate goal of actually trying to treat Alzheimer's or reduce Alzheimer's disease? Well, it turns out uh, that when we uh, treat uh, mice for about 10 weeks with nicotinamide riboside, just providing it in the diet, and we look at the uh, formation of amyloid plaques in the brain of these mice, shown here in green, you can see that the NR-treated mice compared to the untreated mice show a significant reduction of amyloid plaques in number. And even more importantly, this correlates with an improved memory performance in these mice. Here, I'm just showing you one uh, memory test called fear conditioning, where here in red, the wild type mice are performing, let's say in average, uh, decently okay. But the, uh, the Alzheimer's disease mice cannot perform in, term in terms of memory performance as well as the wild type mice. However, when we provide NR to these mice, um, in addition to the reduction of the plaques, we also see now an improved memory co uh, cognition in this in these mice. And this, uh, this is my work, but other labs have shown with other Alzheimer's disease mice, similar results again using uh, nicotinamide riboside. So with these very interesting results in mind, and uh, being interested also in shifting from, uh, from disease to the aging process, with the PhD student I was supervising at the time at EPFL, Mario Romani, we decided to look at the effect of NAD boosting on, now on uh, proteostasis and in muscle aging. Before I go into the results, I want to give you a reminder of what proteostasis is. So proteostasis is actually a delicate balance between protein synthesis, folding, 
uh, degradation and also aggregation. And it's uh, basically uh, to maintain it in balance, there are uh, certain intermediate um, um, uh, sort of uh, aggregates that can be formed called oligomeric aggregates, which form during the folding process of the proteins. Now, there are positive events that can get, can get these oligomeric aggregates in check and keep the proteostasis in a homeostatic manner, such as molecular chaperones, clearance mechanism, detoxifying uh, enzymes. However, there are also negative uh, um, uh, events that can occur. And uh, during the aging process, it's known that the folding of the proteins starts to decline. And therefore, there's more formation of these oligomeric aggregates, which could lead then to the fibrillary tangles and plaques observed in the neurodegenerative diseases. So with this in mind, with my student, what we performed here is a very simple observational experiment where we took primary um, uh, muscle cells from other young, um, young donors, and then also uh, either from healthy uh, old donors or from patients with inclusion body myositis, which is a protein aggregation disease of the mouse. What we did, we simply stained these primary cells with a, with a fluorescent dye that can recognize the presence of amyloid um, aggregates independently of, their, of the protein identity. And very interestingly, while in young, we didn't observe anything in the context of, of healthy aging, let's call it that way, we observe almost the same amount and uh, type of uh, protein uh, or amyloid aggregates observed in a, in a proteostatic diseases. In and, uh, actually highlighting the fact that even the process of healthy aging has already this process occurring, and it's a matter of understanding when it starts becoming pathological. And this is true also, uh, again, when we go down in the evolutionary scale, we see that when we do a dot blotting experiment here and we immunostain the um, um, protein lysates from muscle from young aged mice, again, we see an increased formation of amyloid deposits in the mice. But also when we take uh, protein lysates from young or old worms, this is day one for young worms at just day 11 of aging for worms, we can see a massive accumulation of these uh, protein aggregates. Since this seems to be, again, an evolutionary conserved event, we started uh, wondering whether we could use NAD boosting strategies as we did for Alzheimer, also to improve essentially protostasis in aged muscle. And we started again with C. elegans and we used the compound treatment, so nicotinamide riboside, starting at the onset of aging these worms. And then we looked at amyloid aggregation and mitochondrial function and fitness in these worms. Very importantly, when we actually treat the worms with nicotinamide riboside, we see that the amyloid aggregation is significantly reduced in these worms. And even more importantly, this is mirrored by an improved mitochondrial morphology, which is indicative of mitochondrial function. You can see the mitochondrial network between young worms and old worms being very uh, altered in the context of aging and being uh, restored uh, to a more youthful status in the uh, nr 3 d aged worms. And even more importantly, when we look at health span or mobility in these worms, we can see here in orange that the NR treated aged worms that seem to retain more mobility as they age compared to the wild uh, untreated worms. And for to summarize, we, with NR or NAD boosters in the context of uh, aging, we observe a reduced protein aggregation, an improved mitochondrial function, and improved mobility and health span. And now moving back uh, on the evolutionary uh, up in the back uh, on the evolutionary scale, we now treated with NR the human myotubes from the aged donors, which I showed you before that they contain these protein aggregates. And very importantly, NR treatment again reduced the protein aggregates in the cells. And when we do an in vivo experiment that we take two years old mice and we treat them for eight weeks with nicotinamide riboside in the food, and then we look at the protein aggregates in the muscles, you can see that in aging compared to young, there is an accumulation again here in green of this um, amyloid, age-associated amyloids, but these are significantly reduced once more by an art treatment. So just to conclude and not overload you with uh, additional data, uh, what I learned during my experience in trying to connect uh, proteostasis and mitochondria is that boosting NAD metabolism and mitochondrial stress response, uh, such as UPRMT and mitophagy, may beneficially impact fitness and proteostasis in amyloidogenic diseases, such as Alzheimer or inclusion body myositis, but also very importantly in the context of healthy aging. And understanding and targeting the connections between these hallmarks uh, of aging is key, as I mentioned also before. And also, based on my experience, I would suggest that a wise implementation of multi-species pipelines, as I showed you today, implementing even models such as C. elegans, but you can think also implementing models like zebrafish or killifish 
uh, and then integrating it back with mammalian systems can accelerate discoveries while also contributing to bridge the gap between preclinical science and clinical translation. So what is next based on what I just showed you so far, uh, especially for me now joining the NUS? There are still several questions, I think, based on what I showed you today that I would like to address and that are important for the general field, I would say, of longevity and aging. For instance, the biological processes leading to age-dependent loss of proteostasis and amyloidosis are not fully characterized. And also, the best targets of therapeutic approaches to reduce protein aggregation in aging uh, remain to be uh, discovered. It may be that, that there is alternatives, for instance, to using NAD boosters that need to be defined. And finally, my interest would be in whether we could observe or target these changes early enough in the aging process using preclinical, but also clinical settings in order to promote healthy longevity. And that's why uh, with this, I joined the NUS really with the intention to define and target the mechanisms linking met metabolism to proteostasis uh, to, pro to promote longevity. And I intend to do so by maintaining this cross-species pipeline and even expanding it further with the further use of uh, bioinformatic tools and data analysis. And to do all this work, of course, I cannot do it alone. Therefore, uh, I'm also using this opportunity here to tell us uh, uh, to, uh, to tell you join us uh, as I will be opening some positions soon for for the different roles that you see here below. And of course, also students are welcome to contact me and apply for uh, for internships and uh, uh, temporary assignments. And with this, I really want to thank, I mean, I would have uh, to thank a lot of people, in particular, the people here at NUS, uh, Brian Kennedy, Andrea Meyer, Wen Shen, and uh, also Professor Yap Sen Chong for actually giving me the opportunity to join them. And the all uh, Center for Healthy Longevity team, which, which, is, uh, which has been very amazing so far in welcoming me, my previous collaborators at EPFL, and my, uh, my current collaborators still from Nestle Research, especially on the field of NAD, bioenergetics and nutritional interventions, and my collaborators from Amsterdam and Zurich, especially in the context of kidney disease, aging and metabolism. And with this, I, I'm done and I'm open for questions. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you, Vincenzo. I mean, it's very interesting. Um, I wanted to uh, get back a little bit to this connection to start with between um, proteostasis and uh, mitochondria. Right. Uh, especially in the context of a beta for the moment, uh, because, you know, I, I think one of the challenges in the, in the therapeutic side of Alzheimer's is that making plaques go away in older humans has not been as clinically effective as people had hoped. Um, so one model might be that, you know, if you have these plaques for a period of time, uh, in an older human, you basically just exhaust mitochondrial repair mechanisms. And so even making them go away at that point, the mitochondria can't recover. Is that a, is that a reasonable potential explanation for why making plaques go away hasn't been as effective as we thought? Right. Yeah, no, that's a little bit actually the, well, I would say the main challenge in the neurodegenerative field and the protostatic diseases overall. I mean, because that's the thing. I mean, uh, most of the current clinical trials and pharma companies are, have, are, have heavily invested in trying to target specifically the beta plaques uh, in the context of Alzheimer's disease with immunotherapies, with antibodies, essentially. And while this seemed to be effective in, let's say, promoting removal of the plaques, the problem is that the damage, indeed, as you mentioned, has already occurred and the neurons, it seems like the memory uh, impairment cannot be resolved, probably due to extensive damage. In my, I would say this could also, what have we seen is that this certainly damages mitochondria, but in my experiments, especially with the nematodes, what I've seen is that if you, or even with cells, if you block actually the mitochondrial stress responses, even at, uh, without any further treatment, the damage is even further which means that actually the mitochondria are trying to counteract the damage for quite some time. And they can actually be, if we have ways to actually boost that function and perhaps early enough, that's the other point. I think then we, still, we may have alternative ways to uh, improve mitochondrial homeostasis and then indirectly get improved proteostasis as well, which could actually be the alternative way than going for the plaques and then trying to recover mitochondria. I think with my approach, or my idea, and also from the work from Fungfa is clearly pointing at the fact that if we improve mitochondria, then we may also improve proteostasis. And that could be another way to go in alternative to using immunotherapies, for instance. Do you think mitochondrial dysfunction could actually be a little bit upstream of the, the plaque formation? I mean, I, you think, uh, in, in other words, 
you know, something has to be age dependent that causes these neurodegenerative right. syndromes to happen. Um, people with genetic mutations prone to neurodegeneration still don't get sick early in their life generally. So right. maybe there's a dysfunctional mitochondria that's a triggering thing and that causes plaques and that further damages mitochondria as like a speed forward type thing. Right. Yeah. So that could be an option. I mean, in sense there is still more need of evidence for this also, especially in the clinical setting. I mean, one thing we know, especially in the context of the preclinical work, we, we and others perform, usually we work with very established model of disease uh, preclinically where we know exactly at what age of the rodents in this case, we are going to get the plaque formation occurring. And we start the interventions usually in a sort of semi preventative manner in sense we know the plaques are there but the damage is just starting to occur and when we boost NAD or mitophagy and we boost mitochondrial function in that context we can get a natural recovery so for sure I would say there is an early mitochondrial or metabolic impairment that could even precede perhaps the, the damage caused by the plaques however I would say in general, even with the look at the mitochondrial dysfunction what's going to be important in the context of these chronic diseases is always how early we can diagnose, how early we can start seeing the signs of metabolic or protostatic uh, alterations so that we can intervene as early as possible. Yeah, along those lines, you know, jumping forward to the NR, you know, you've showed in, in mice that you could uh, reduce plaque formation by NR treatment. Uh, when, when were you giving the mice NR relative to when they start getting plaques? I know it's a genetic model where they get plaques relatively early. Uh, yeah. And, and, Related to that, can you wait until the plaques are significantly progressed, then give NR and see any effects? Yeah, right. So that's the thing. Yeah. So in this case, I mean, this model develops plaques around already four to five months of age. And we actually started the treatment, uh, I would say, around that, that time. I mean, as soon as the mice were habituated in the facility, we started the treatment. So it was a little bit at the onset, I would say, of the damage. Uh, and that's true also for other studies. I mean, I think... I don't know if people have tried to do this in mice with really having much more developed, let's say, phenotype. I think waiting, for instance, even six months or a year into the disease and then starting the treatment. So this is certainly something that would be interesting to indeed understand, to also allow us to understand how early or late we can still find uh, some ways to improve. What we know from, for instance, from the, again, from the easier model like the nematodes, is that even if we intervene uh, after the prototoxic damage has been induced, we get a milder effect than if we intervene before the damage is induced, but we can still get a partial rescue. So now this is a simpler model. Of course, it doesn't have the complexity of a brain, but we still see some effectiveness in, in the treatments that we perform, meaning that again, if there is some hope that if you don't start too late, we may actually still get some partial benefits. Have, have you or anyone else tried to improve mitochondrial function and remove plaques at the same time? So, uh... Yeah, uh, me, no, I mean, that's actually something that I was thinking, whether combining something like immunotherapy plus, uh, like providing, an, like, let's say, an, an NAD precursor or a metabolic inducer may actually have a synergistic or combine, a combination of combinatorial effect. Uh, but this is certainly something that I think would be interesting to, to look into it. This, this broadened this out, I mean, because uh, the implication of your talk was not just Alzheimer's. It was uh, a whole range of different aggregation-prone syndromes. Uh, you, you mentioned a m muscle one um, that we can come back to. Um, and I think your, your point is that there's a connection between proteostatic dysfunction, aggregation, and mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, but if you, you know, how, how general is that? Is it just that any kind of aggregation occurs, it screws up the proteasome and then mitochondria function declines or you think that different kinds of aggregation, different proteins, different uh, compartments of the cell might lead to um, different effects on the mitochondria. Right, well, that's, that's, I mean, an important point. I mean, it's an important question and that's in the context of aging, I would say that's exactly a little bit part of the aims that I would like to develop in the sense what we have seen is that there seems to be this evolutionary conserved presence of amyloid deposits independently of the species. So even worms that do not have a beta, you know, they don't express normally APP, they do seem to have this amyloid aggregation. And what's I think important to understand is what kind of proteins are part of these aggregates and what kind of aggregates we are actually getting. If inclusion bodies 
or uh, things that should go to the proteasome and are not degraded in order then to understand and map which of these pathways are, are, let's say, more essential. What I foresee is that there's going to be, we know that in aging, there's a decline in proteasomal function, in lysosomal degradation, in autophagy as well, especially also linked to the old marks of aging. The problem is that what we do not know is, for instance, based on these amyloid aggregates that we have observed and the fact that they do get improved through NAD uh, metabolism, what, which kind of aggregates we, or proteins we are actually targeting and for what pathway that we are we may be able to restore by doing so. So I think it's going to be important to understand what are really and dissect what are really the pathways involved so that we can actually define better uh, therapeutic interventions, in my opinion, for this. So this, for me, it's an open question. It's not so established yet, I would say. You know, we know that all these proteases pathways collapse, but in this particular context, we also know that we can rescue. So what pathways are we bringing up now or what are we favoring? Yeah, that's that's my question, personal question as well. So tell me a little bit more about this model of inclusion body myositis. Right. Uh, you mean the nematode model or the cellular model? I think you use the cellular model, right? With, right. With, uh, yeah. So these are prime. Yeah. So these are primary. So both for the uh, LT aging, let's say, and for the inclusion body myositis, we use primary uh, myoblasts that you can differentiate into myotubes. Uh, from uh, from essential human donors, which were actually provided by um, uh, by a, um, a repository in Belgium. Uh, so basically, you can you know, as an academic or part of a company, you can always purchase uh, or request these cell lines, and then basically you can culture them as primary cells. And then basically, what, very simply, what we did here, we differentiated into myotubes and then simply performed a staining for uh, amyloid aggregation. So in that sense, the inclusion body myositis comes from the fact that the patient was carrying the disease and there are, we have cases here, I was showing just one example, but we got, for instance, uh, three types of inclusion body myositis patients, two with two different mutations uh, in P62, for instance, which is linked to autophagy impairment and uh, BCP, which is also important uh, for uh, protein degradation and uh, autophagy. And then one sporadic case, which it's not, we don't know what is the cause, but it shows the same phenotypes. So actually there is several of these patients and several mutations linked to inclusion body myositis, but the phenotype of this protein aggregation and impairment of muscle function, loss of muscle mass is almost like, a, I would say it looks like almost like a sarcopenic phenotype plus the protein aggregation phenotype, which is even more uh, detrimental in this case. Yeah, it might be an interesting model to work with. Is it age related? Yeah, so uh, so yeah, the, I, I inclusion body myositis is uh, highly prevalent in the aged population. So over from 50, 60 uh, going up, it still becomes more prevalent. Even if you're carrying the mutation, it only starts showing much more uh, with aging. So certainly there may be some underlying things, again, a little bit as for Alzheimer's disease or dementia or sporadic cases of dementia, where we do not know exactly when the onset may occur but it's certainly worsened by aging, yeah. Have you looked at things like Huntington's disease or other things where there might be nuclear aggregation? Uh, we have, well, I've done just some simple work on nematodes with that. So with Huntington or ALS uh, sort of protein aggregates, so synucleins uh, or uh, for Parkinson, Huntington, and also uh, SOT2 mutations in nematodes. And also interestingly there, Similarly to what I showed you for Alzheimer, when you have these nematode models of aggregation, their fitness, mobility, mitochondrial uh, function goes down. But when you treat, for instance, uh, with uh, things that can boost UPRMT, for instance, antibiotics like doxycycline, or with NAD boosters, we again see this reduction of protein aggregates mirrored by increased L-span. I have worked with mammalian models, but for instance, in the context of Parkinson in humans now, there is a sort of first, there's this not park clinical trial that was recently published, I think last, just last year, which showed actually in at Parkinson disease patients that treating with nicotinamide riboside increases energy in the brain, alters the mitochondrial metabolism, and also sort of reduces some of the pro-inflammatory signals uh, related to Parkinson. I don't think they've looked at the synuclein aggregates in their clinical context, I guess, you know, because it's hard to access samples in this case. But like, uh, I think there is, seems that, that there is a clinical translation possibility for neurodegeneration with uh, with these compounds, yeah. Okay, last question. I have to ask this because I get asked all the time. NRNMN, where uh, do you stand in this debate? Well, 
well i mean like you know there are several there are several factors that come into play you know the the compound per se you know the uh, efficacy of the compounds and then of course of the let's say political debate on the uh, regulatory debate on whether which one is a comp is a drug which one is a, a supplement and so on from my personal uh and, and uh, let's say experience, especially testing things preclinically, I would say that the principle through which nicotine and my riboside and NNM they work is, I would say, and the efficacy that we get preclinically at least is quite comparable, I would say. Then if you want to look at the compound properties, for instance, we know that uh, nicotine and my riboside has issues of stability in solution. So if you put it in water, it's much less stable than NNM or than other compounds. Uh, however, I would say, based on what we are seeing, and especially with the current uh, issues in terms of re regulatory, I would say this certainly opens the possibility to leverage more the nicotine and my riboside trials and to push more in that direction, while still understanding also if NNM could be, uh, from a clinical perspective, more um, to show more efficacy, because the, there is only few trials with NNM compared to NR. And also, in my opinion, also opens the possibility to re, I'll say, to rediscover or discover new NAD precursors that could be important or could be sort of underused at the moment. Because we know that, for instance, if you take niacin, which yes, okay, has the problem of the flushing, you know, it's people don't cope well with it. Uh, when you take mitochondrial diseases, so this is work from Aapirin and and Sumolan, and so in cl even clinical trials. Then if you take mitochondrial disease patients, actually nic uh, nicotinic acids or niacin seems to work uh, for these patients. So I think we need to keep an eye open on which NAD precursor could be good for which application. Great. So I want to bring in a Sabrina Adam, uh, who's going to, uh, she's been collating questions from the audience and she's going to ask you some of them. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you for the introduction, Brian. Um, we have some questions from the audience. I'll give you the first one. Um, they are asking if there is a gender difference with regards to the initiation, progression, or severity of mitochondrial function decline and proteostasis during aging. Gender difference. Well, mm. in, in, on the interconnection between the two, I mean, we have, well, so far, our, at least our preclinical studies, we have focused mostly on, on the use of, let's say, uh, male mice. I mean, male, uh, just for simplicity, I mean, to avoid other conf uh, conf uh, confusing factors. I think nowadays it will be more and more important in next studies. We are currently performing some preclinical studies from my previous work where we are going to also mix now two genders in order to see if the mitochondria and NAD metabolism in this case are impacted. The loss of protostasis, whether there is gender specificity there, I'm not, uh, not familiar with it, actually. It could be a very interesting question, especially in the context of, for instance, things like that does seem to be specific for, for, in, for instance, for the uh, feminine gender in terms of um, loss of fertility in that sense. So these are things that have been completely underlooked, I think. The next question is, what are some of the practical or natural ways that we can prevent or attenuate the decline of mitochondrial function and proteostasis during aging? Yeah, depends a little bit, I think, also on the tissue, let's say, or the application that you're interested in. I would say even in the context, for instance, of sarcopenia or inclusion body myositis, there are not many therapies at the moment um, that even same as for Alzheimer, that could really get rid of this protostatic defect while restoring memory or muscle function. So some of the current applications of clinical trials are actually focusing on dietary interventions and uh, also exercise. So it seems like people that perform regular exercise, for instance, that do seem to maintain more cognitive function or they are more resistant to cognitive decline as they age, or even in the context of Alzheimer and dementia. And for inclusion body myositis, which is quite, I'd say, uh, impairing for mobility and for, for strength in people, they are really trying to see whether soft exercise and again, uh, dietary interventions aimed at maintaining, for instance, protein synthesis in the muscle can actually uh, bring some alleviation or amelioration of the condition. But in terms of real condition, I would say natural, uh, say, compounds or things that could help, I mean, I would really still support based on my research things that could promote mitochondrial function on one end and also perhaps look into compounds that could prevent protein aggregation or could promote proteostasis but in terms of natural compound that could promote proteostasis at the cellular level i think there's still a lot of work to be done and we don't have like i would say a lot of established candidates that can do so 
Yeah, there's another question that asked about using um Aztexin. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Aztexin, I think. Um, to reverse plaque formation. Or uh, at least prevent the progression of atherosclerosis. Okay, yeah. So uh, I'm not too familiar with the compound. Uh, maybe there is a way uh, that they can explain what the compound is supposed to do or what is the, the mechanism, if there is none. I mean, yeah. just because, yeah, uh, to, to understand how, how it works. It's uh, astaxanthin. It's from, oh, okay. uh, um, I guess, it's from the melon extract, pomegranate. Uh, it's used, uh, it's a supplement that some people take for longevity as well. Right. Uh, um, but I don't know any data specifically on this, uh, um, on these phenotypes. Right. Yeah. For this, I would have to look it up. I think if, if it has been used in the context of dementia or neurodegeneration, I'm not sure. Yeah. I would have to look it up. It's, uh, I will keep it in mind. Yeah. The next question is what if we test the effects of NAD on mitochondria in red blood cells? And the key reason being that red blood cells have no nucleus and that they are very, they have a very predefined uh, lifespan. So testing the NAD on red blood cells would show whether the NAD itself is directly involved in the well-being of the mitochondria or if the nucleus is essential for their restoration. Uh, well, I mean, that's, yeah, so let's see. I mean, certainly when we use NAD precursors at the, uh, and we actually, one way to test the efficacy of NAD precursors, we usually do look at the, uh, let's say, world blood uh, for NAD levels. And we, you know, that we do it at the level of PBMCs and so on. Whether the NAD, I mean, NAD in a way can be directly involved in mitochondrial function because, you know, you, you can regenerate essentially the, you have mitochondrial NAD pools that is important for the oxfos function. And then you have also the cellular and nuclear NAD pools, which are used essentially for more the sirtuin function if you want at the level of the nucleus. So I think that's an interesting question probably to test. I mean, I'm not sure how easy or feasible would be to dissect uh, the effect, let's say, without the with the lack of nucleus in the red blood cells. But I would say there are certainly nuclear effects coming from the, let's say, using NAD to boost essentially the mitochondrial homeostasis through the sirtuin pathways, which are, let's say, mostly nucleus, but there are also uh, mitochondrial sirtuins, and then effects of NAD in, internal to the mitochondria to regenerate the, the NAD pool in the mitochondria to promote uh, mitochondrial respiration. And if, if I can jump in here, sorry, I keep jumping in. Uh, red blood cells, once they're mature, don't have mitochondrial function either. So uh, I mm -hmm. think it would be hard to dissect that mm -hmm. question, uh, although it's a good idea to try to peel apart the different effects of yeah. Uh, NAD. I think people measure, yeah, they try to measure essentially NAD compartment, the compartmentalization by isolating the organelles and so on, but it's not always a clean system. I mean, it has its challenges, yeah. And uh, what would you say are some of the major challenges or limitations of targeting the decline in mitochondrial function, um, as well as proteostasis during aging, in order to improve the health span and lifespan in humans? Right. Well, I mean, really here, the, the problems, I would say the most, I mean, the challenge that we have when we try to do this is really which kind of readouts of efficacy uh, by targeting mitochondria we can expect to see in humans. Because at the preclinical level, we can do deep phenotyping and try to find what works. But when you go to the clinical space, we need to usually focus on what's accessible in terms of biopsies or samples that we can analyze from a molecular efficacy standpoint and then the physical um, uh, parameters. So I would say really the challenge will remain the, the, the one related to the availability of compounds and the specificity of the compounds to target, for instance, mitochondria and not other, let's say, uh, things within our body, like gut microbiome and so on, because most of these compounds that affect mitochondria also can affect the gut microbiome. And also whether uh, this the benefits that we see preclinically, because we have a lot of mitochondrial compounds that at the preclinical level, they show efficacy, how we can actually translate this in the clinical space. And I think here really using good uh, readouts like biomarkers of molecular efficacy first, and then think well with the clinicians how to bridge the gap and then try to get one or two uh, physical readouts that work well, that would be, I would say it's the biggest challenge that we have at the moment. So someone has a follow-up question. Um, does yoga, Zen type of exercises uh, it has claims to have more benefits on healthy longevity? And apparently there are some publications that support this statement. So do you have any comments on that? 
Uh, well, I mean, certainly, I think all this, I mean, I'd say practices that are important for the body and the mind, I think there's more and more this, I'd say, uh, understanding that, you know, you, you have to improve your body, but you also have to take care of your mind in that sense, that can certainly have, I'd say, an overall benefit, uh, because it's part of the lifestyle interventions, as we call them, uh, mm -hmm. that are not necessarily uh, compound related, but they still can bring the, the benefit, even sleeping can be, it's considered one of the lifestyle interventions in order to improve um, uh, longevity. So yeah, I do think that having a regular uh, diet, sleep and uh, meditation and also physical routine, you know, without exceeding, but uh, regular, I think it can certainly improve, I would say, or help a little bit with our self perception also and with our um, feeling better and doing better. Yeah. Got it. So any sort of exercise that sort of calms us down and makes us move a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say, yeah. So regarding the exercise, I mean, the question, this is, there is a question in the question, because in that sense, I mean, people are starting as we speak, which kind of exercise or diet regimen, for instance, are important for which status. So for instance, if you are, let's say, healthy uh, senior and you are uh, doing like, um, let's say, intense exercise three times per week, you know, we know that, for instance, the muscles don't decline as much as maybe mm -hmm. someone that is completely sedentary, but we don't know yet if doing acute exercise or for instance, um, um, I'll say resistance exercise or doing it only once all the way to the weekend or throughout the week. I mean, there are several studies that are trying to pinpoint which kind of exercise we need for which uh, status essentially. So this is going to be still something that will come up, I think in the future. Yeah. Also, you know, yoga is complicated, right? Because it's exercise, it's yeah, yoga it's is mental very, awareness, I it's breathing. Yoga. <laughs> yeah, it's also balance. And so mm -hmm. it's hard to, yeah. I'm convinced it's beneficial. It's hard to disentangle which of those things are having the biggest impacts though. Right. So I should certainly work on my yoga that I'm aware of. <laughs> yeah, me too. I should probably work on not getting up at 3.30 in the morning as well. <laughs> Just disrupt my sleep. <laughs> Do you have like one last question, Sabrina? Um, sure, I think we'll go with a short question here. Um, would epigenetic age testing methylation based um, help us understand the clinical efficacy that you mentioned? Uh, you mean like uh, like checking, for instance, things like biological clocks, like uh, epigenetic? Could be. I think that's what they're referring to. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, well, even, I mean, work from, uh, from here, I mean, from uh, Brian and other people, I mean, they are, especially moving into, into the clinical space, people are starting to look at whether interventions that are improving metabolism, so anything from yeah, alpha ketoglutarate to mitochondria function and so on, whether they can slow down or uh, let's say bring back a bit the epigenetic clock, so sort of reju sort of slowing down essentially the biological clock. There is some certainly promising uh, results coming up from these different trials, I think. Um, now the question for me, or I think related to this, would be interesting to see whether interventions that target proteostasis could also uh, bring back the epigenetic clock. So that's, again, totally undone, I think, and it would be certainly mm -hmm. interesting because I think for me, I would like indeed to bring some of this uh, knowledge that I have now on the proteostasis in the clinical setting, and that would be certainly one of the parameters to check in order to see how well proteostasis interventions and metabolic interventions can slow down or reverse to some extent the epigenetic uh, changes as well. Well, thank you, Sabrina. And uh, thanks, Vincenzo. Thank uh, you. Uh, if you're in Singapore and you come to our future events, I'm sure Vincenzo will be there. You can talk to him in person uh, and mm -hmm. ask uh, more detailed questions. I want to remind everyone to use the chat function and panelists and all attendees option to leave comments and feedback. Uh, news from our center and also the School of Medicine will be available in the end credits. Our center, we're always looking for people that are interested about longevity research. You heard from Vincenzo that he's looking for people. The center has uh, a range of oppor career opportunities for people that wanna move into this area. There's a QR code at the end of the webinar if you're interested in that. Also, we launched our Center for Healthy Longevity with a full day event at Alexandra Hospital uh, last September. All of those talks from key leaders in the field are available online. There's a QR code for that as well. Uh, starting in 2023, we want to again thank Leo Drago and Antonia uh, Hui for making this webinar possible. Uh, and the next episode will be next Thursday, uh, where we'll have um, Shahaf Pelig on, who will be talking about energy replacement using the energy of light to enhance mitochondrial function and increase lifespan. Uh, Andrea Meyer will be the host. 
And I want to leave you with a final video on how to age gracefully. Thank you for coming. Dear 36 year old, stop caring so much about what other people think. They're not thinking about you at all. Signed, a 47 year old. Dear 47 year old, a midlife crisis does not look good on you. Signed, a 48 year old. Dear 48 year old, always tell the truth, except when it comes to your online dating profile. Dear 51 year old, one cat is enough cats. Signed, a 53 year old. Dear 53 year old, it's never too late to try something new. I've decided to take my husband's Corvette and go to racing school. If Paul Newman could do it, why can't I? Dear 72 year old, spend all your money. Otherwise, your kids are going to do it for you. Sincerely, an 85 year old. Dear 85 year old, indulge your sweet tooth. You'll need that here soon anyway. My late wife made the best apple pie that you could ever find. When she cut the pieces, she would cut small ones, and when she came to me, she would cut a big one. Dear 88-year-old, cultivate younger friends. Otherwise, yours will all die off. Sincerely, 91 years old. Dear 91-year-old, don't listen to other people's advice. Nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Sign a 93-year-old. Just do your own thing. That's the way I say it. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing can take this I can see it clearly now nothing gonna bring me down